Okay, so this might be a little silly, but this was my honest reaction seeing this thing for the first time. Well, it looks like everyone's enjoying my Left Behind review. Oh, what's that? Yeah, sure, why not? I'll take a look at it. The Bible tells the story of a young man named Joshua, who was strong and full of courage, who led his people into the what promised in the land. God damn. And it was all downhill from there. This movie is... This movie is... Wow. This movie is bad. I mean, when my second year Animation 2 final can stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with your professional production, there's a problem. Everything I've managed to find out about this abomination points to it being a pet project. And I hate going after pet projects because they're a labor of love, and nothing is more precious than- OH MY GOD, WHAT THE FUCK IS THAT?! NO, NO, LOVE IS HORRIBLE! JESUS, WHAT MADE YOU THINK THIS WAS DONE?! These characters look like severe burn victims with fur and mascot heads super glued to their bodies! The textures are just flat colors or stuff you rip from Google Images! And the animations! Oh, God! Oh, but this isn't just a case of bad animations. This is a case of almost everything about this being wrong. This is Joshua and the Promised Land. Right from the get-go, this movie is showing us its true colors. Opening on a 3D logo whose landscape makes me feel like I should be landing something from Kerbal on it. Then we see, ah, ah, what the fuck is that thing supposed to be? Ah, it doesn't look like it's got any skin. And what the hell is up with those eyes? It looks like someone poked holes in its fucking head. Why does he have a black bow tie on? And why are his arms tentacles? Ugh, it looks like someone cut off its nose. No, no, you stop looking at me. You're too fucking creepy. But it doesn't end there, because after we meet skinned pig demon dog thing, we get to see the titular character Joshua, who's apparently watching a video of a lion fursuiter being vaporized by a poorly animated orb of fire. Then he moves, and the pure horror of what you're watching becomes evident. I mean... Jesus. You know, it might help your animations look more natural and less like I'm watching a badly decomposed corpse being dangled in front of my face on invisible wires if your models had, like, butts and muscle tone and clothes. Come to think of it, why is everyone naked? It doesn't really help that Joshua's, I guess, fur is flesh tone, giving him the appearance of being a ragdoll made of pig skin. The only other colors on him is the white fur on his belly and muzzle. But because his face lacks basically any detail and his nose is solid black, all the white fur does is make him look like a ragdoll made of pig skin with a fucking cat skull in its head with the bare bone exposed by the mouth hole. And really, if you're trying to make a kid's movie, the design of your main character probably shouldn't bring that image to mind. Anyway, Joshua's flat-butted pigskin cat skull horror toy father comes in and acts like a dick to him. Hi, Dad. Pick up your stuff, Joshua. Then he sits down and gets into a fight with the slightly modified clone that he married. Well, if you would just stop spending so much time on that car of yours, I wouldn't get so upset. Oh. Honestly, Joshua, will you please get out of the way? I'm trying to fix dinner. Needless to say, Joshua hates his terrible nightmare existence and goes up to his room to lay on a solid block of marble he apparently likes. Then the skinless, noseless, rotting goat dog demon person shows up to judge him and decrees that he needs a friend in the form of this character, who I like to call Danny the Perverted Doberman. Why do I call him Danny the Perverted Doberman? Well, it's kind of complicated, but uh, let's just say his actions in the movie make more sense if you think of him as like the ghost of a pedophile who's trying to make up for his past deeds by playing the whole guardian angel deal. He flies around the skin doll's room and finds his shelf of miniature corpses and all of a sudden the look of the characters is starting to make some sense to me. I think that a while back in the film's development the main characters were supposed to be humans and these were supposed to be rag dolls. But then something happened like maybe a time crunch or no one on the team was able to make humans that didn't look like they had been dead for several months. But the decision was made to turn all these characters into the rag dolls. Who are you? Some people call me the best friend, but my real name is Christopher Andrew Eugene Bazzioni at your service. What? You didn't know that all Italians were floating sparkle dogs? 
Listen, Joshua, I came here to take you on a little kind of trip, you know? It's your choice if you want to go or not, but I really think you should consider it. Where do you want to take me? I can't tell you that till we get there. See what I mean? Danny the Perverted Doberman. I don't know. My mom will get mad if I'm late for dinner. Hey, I promise that I will have you back in time for dinner. Anyway, he manages to convince the kid to take his hand and leave the safety of his house to go on a special trip. Remember, kids, if a naked guy covered in glitter floats into your room and tells you you have to go on an adventure with him, you better go. Nice lesson to teach him, Joshua in the Promised Land. Well, yeah, he is floating, though. That's the caveat. If the naked glitter-covered dude is floating, then you can believe him. Just make sure you don't let go of my hand. Where are we going? Did you ever hear the phrase, somewhere over the rainbow? Yeah. Well, hang on. So they go through the pinball portal and end up in low poly Egypt. Here we go. Here we go. Relax. Danny, <laughs> you pervert. Get the fuck away from that kid. If you've never seen one, this is a pyramid. It was built by the Jews, who were slaves of the pharaohs a long, long time ago. Actually, that's not true at all. See, right now there are two competing theories on who exactly built the pyramid. On the one hand, there's the correct theory that skilled labor was used since Egyptians wouldn't have used slaves to build a holy site. And on the other hand, there's shit that bubbles in your palm and tells you aliens built them. Aliens who used humans as slaves to mine gold because it's stupid and why the hell would aliens go through the trouble of genetically engineering humans as a slave race to mine gold when there's more gold just floating around in the asteroid belt than on Earth and all they would have to do is mine it with robots and save a shit ton of time! And let's not even go over the fact that any species that's capable of traversing vast distances between stars probably wouldn't need to bother with mining in the first place! And why the hell would they need gold? At that level of technology, wouldn't they just be able to manufacture the elements they needed to- So they go off flying over the horribly modeled army of the Pharaoh. They move at such speed that if this were real, the poor kid's arm would have ripped off at the bone. Me, my chariot! Oh, wow. I. Okay, the Pharaoh's a gorilla. What? I. I don't even know how to respond to that. I mean, look at it. It's insane. I mean, where do I begin? Why is he a gorilla? Why is he walking like he's bobbing his head to something? Why are his eyes bloating out of his face? And what the hell is that thing on his head? And don't for one second tell me that's an Egyptian headdress, because right now it looks more like a big bone tumor. And what the friggity fuck is up with that horse's leg? Why does it dislocate when it moves? That's not how a horse moves. You know, some people just never learn. God can hit them right over the head with a big, thick hammer, and they still don't get it. A big what? With a big, thick hammer, and they still don't get it. Is this real? Like, am I actually reviewing an elaborate hallucination, or is this a real thing that was made? Because if it is, man, fuck it, I give up. If you never take my advice again for as long as you live, take my advice on this. When you fight against God, you always lose. What the hell kind of expression is that supposed to be? When you fight against God, you always lose. The two then fly over a sea of no-clipping horses and go through a canyon that I think might be somewhere in Kerbal's western continent when they come across a wall of what's supposed to be fire. It may be cool, kid, but it's something we can't go near. That's the presence of God there protecting the Hebrews. No man can touch it and live. Come on! Yeah! You know what would help right here? The kid's shadow. Just something to give me a sense of scale here, because right now it looks like he's falling into a pit of green slime. I mean, he does this thing where he rolls over, but I can't tell if he's hit the side of the hill, or he's rolling in the air, or... Okay, so he's just straight up falling. 
So what the hell did he hit there? Fine, fine, I'll stop criticizing the animations, because honestly, if I didn't, this review would be hours and hours long. But you see this? You see this, this thing right here? That is but a taste of things to come in this movie. Just let that swim around in your head. Listen, Joshua. Sometimes a no means maybe. I'll grant you that. An Italian floating sparkling Doberman pedophile ghost just stole a young boy from his family of nudist pigskin cat bone dolls and ripped him out of space time to a poorly rendered ancient Egypt to watch the biblical exodus as reenacted by people in badly fabricated fursuits. And you're going to argue the semantics of no. I can't. I, I can't even. According to the Bible, Moses is the guy God picked to do all his miracles and lead the slaves to freedom. He's one of the good guys. The Bible also says that Moses was a rubber blow-up chimpanzee pool toy with a beard. Anyway, Danny the pervert decides to... the hell... Anyway, he decides to take Joshua and fuse him into the body of the biblical Joshua and then makes him walk the width of the Red Sea. Now, I didn't know this, but apparently the waters of the Red Sea have the consistency of mashed potatoes. Now you know why I didn't take that long walk with you. It was miles and miles. I want to go home. You'll be going home soon enough. You'll be going home soon enough. Once on the other side, the firewall thing floats over and becomes a... a purple. Then the blue mashed potatoes falls down and kills the Egyptians, brutally smothering them in its rich, buttery flavor. And also Danny turns green. I don't know how. I mean, they're green horses, so why not? The skinless dog pig then says that they didn't bring any food with them, even though we see them bring a whole herd of sheep. And so they're all getting mad because they're dying of starvation in the middle of the desert. So Moses goes and talks to a white column of something, and then... Joshua, son of Nun, I'm hungry. Would you mind fetching a quail so we can eat? Hey, you might not want to eat that. It looks like it's gone a little rancid. But they don't have to eat rotten bird for long because God starts making it rain... Jewish cookies. So many Jewish cookies that it actually affects the frame rate of the universe. Quail didn't last long, so God also gave them something called manna. It's like a cookie, only it's really good for you. Joshua likes it. How can you tell if Joshua likes it? That expression could mean literally anything in this place. But then the Amalekites show up, and poor Joshua is forced to lead an army of foreground, background, confused, bloated, anthropomorphic tigers, pandas, monkeys, and blue... Cows? Versus an army of... Okay, seriously, what the hell are those things supposed to be? Are they goats? Demons? Whatever they are, Joshua kills a fair amount of them. Now keep in mind, he might be in the body of an adult, but he's only 9 or 10. And this isn't like shooting someone either. That would be bad enough, but this is a sword fight. He's sticking that blade into people feeling it cut and slice up their insides. Now, I know this is a Christian children's movie and they're trying to make it exciting, and I know these are the enemies of God and are therefore supposed to not be thought of as people with thoughts and feelings and loved ones and a desire to live because only people God likes have those. But even with all that, he's still killing people. Even if you're a soldier and have been training for months to do that, it still kind of fucks you up a little. I try to not get too analytical when it comes to cartoons, especially poor ones. But here's a list of things poor Joshua is probably in for thanks to Danny the Pervert's insistence that he go out and stab people. Sleeplessness. Re-experiencing the events through vivid nightmares. Emotional numbing. Persistent fears and or jumpiness. Sudden angry outbursts. Losing interest in activities that were enjoyable in the past. Forgetting how or being unable to talk. Nausea, loss of appetite, unexplained headaches, long-term inability to deal with social interactions, learning difficulties, inability to gain or maintain meaningful relationships, suicidal behaviors, and an increased risk of suicide. Thanks, Danny! Are you in any pain? Of course not! <laughs> 
Luckily, though, Moses was able to keep his hands in the air, so they win. Joshua is then forced to walk through a field of corpses and try and sleep that night. During the night, God tells Moses that if the Hebrews follow all his laws, he'll like them more than everyone else. Now, if you keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. They all go up on a mountain where God has for some reason created a level brick pad where they all gather around a cylinder of fire with a bunch of what I can assume are sparkling ghost perverts floating around it. And what is with these off layers? Did you not watch this before you put it on DVD? They all sit down and eat... Play-Doh. Okay, no, see, why are there walruses? I can forgive the bears and the monkeys and the lions and the dogs, but walruses? I mean, I gather that these animals are all supposed to represent different Jewish tribes. I, I mean, I think that's what's going on here. But like, really? Walruses? I'll give you credit, though, out of all the animals, their heads are the most detailed. Joshua, then, having not suffered enough in the sex-hungry eyes of Danny, is now forced to walk up the mountain with Moses and made to sit waiting for him for days without food or water. Too happy, does he? I feel like giving him a book or something, poor guy. But that's all right. Hardship can build good character. Yeah, but the thing is, we kind of already went over the sort of character we can look forward to in Joshua's future. They go back down and find everyone's worshipping a golden statue of a lump of coal. Moses gets all mad, so he breaks the tablets that God just made before making everyone drink golden mashed potatoes for not understanding how to be in the foreground. Cut to several years later, and a hyper-paranoid Joshua, who still hasn't yet learned how to be properly integrated into a shot, is spying on a city called Jericho that's inhabited by demons, so the intended audience doesn't have to burden their delicate little minds with thinking of any of these people as, you know, people. He also sees them sacrifice a baby. This helps play into the whole demon thing, too. Hi, kid. Hi, Chris. Hey, kid. I'm not a genius, you know. But even I can tell something's wrong. What's bugging you? Gee, I don't know, Danny. You know, it might have something to do with you stealing me from my home three years ago and making me trek across the desert. Maybe there's something wrong with me because I was nearly starved to death three fucking times. And maybe I'm a little pissed off because you made me participate in a fucking sword battle, Danny. I fucking killed people. Moses said God promised a land to our ancestor Abraham and that we have to scout it out now so we can plan our invasion. But we can't take over the land without getting rid of the people who are already here. Oh boy. Mm, I have to very quickly justify killing everyone. Josh, uh, when you were scouting Jericho, did you see anything weird? Like evil, bad, uh, weird? Yeah, they killed a baby. Aha! Uh -huh. Ritual sacrifice. Don't you see? These people are doing things detestable to God. They murder, they steal, they commit adultery. The point is, they're breaking all Ten Commandments and God has decreed they've got to go. But Danny, you do know that when I say get rid of, I mean kill all of them. Men, women, and children. Are you saying that it's bad for them to do something God doesn't like once a year or so, but it's okay for us to do it wholesale? At what point is it okay to kill kids, Danny? Well, I guess if you put it that way... Good man. There's a big difference between fighting a war when people just want to kill you and fighting one to make the world a better place. It's a lot harder to find that kind of courage. So wait a minute, wait a second here, skin dog pig man. I mean, I'm kind of assuming that if I'm going to war, people want to kill me already, but what are you saying? Are you saying that people who pose no threat to us should be killed regardless because we don't like them? Joshua tries to float this idea of mass murder, but the rest of the people are like, eh, we don't want to because we don't think we can take them. God doesn't like this, so he makes them wander around the desert for 40 years so they'll all die except Caleb and Joshua. So we can also toss watching all your friends die in a fucking wasteland on top of the tower of grievances that we can lay at the ghostly feet of Danny the perverted Doberman. Then one day Moses disobeyed God. It was a small thing, really. He was angry and he hit this rock with his staff twice. God had told him to call forth water from the rock with his voice, not to hit it with his staff. So even Moses is condemned to die in the desert. Wow, God's a dick. Moses gets to see the promised land once, and I've got to say, it doesn't look that far away. I mean, really, they kind of look like they're already in it. 
It seems like all Moses would have to do is roll down the hill and he'd be right there. So once Moses is dead, Joshua comes down to the others and says, Okay, guys, we're gonna go take care of that Jericho problem. And they're all like, yeah! They get there, and instead of Joshua and his army having to do any killing, they just march around the city for a few days. Then a bunch of ghosts show up with hammers and smash up the place. I say ghosts because that's what they look like. They have no wings and no legs. They look like ghosts. They actually look like huge versions of Danny. And then, something strange happens. Okay, so, follow me here. One of the bricks turns into a red starburst candy, which then turns into a floating red lion head that floats around the ruins. And no one says anything. So, are you ready to wake up? Wake up? D Wait a minute, Danny, I've been fucking dreaming?! I've lived 40 years, Danny! You saying I've been dreaming this whole time?! You asshole, Danny! You stole my life from me! Danny then spreads fairy dust on Joshua, and the two apparate back to the real fake world, but the red gorilla head thing follows them. Then Joshua wakes up back on his favorite slab of marble. Danny turns into electrified meat chunks, and Joshua is just about to leave his room when... So Joshua goes back downstairs and instead of running to his parents and saying how much he's missed them because, you know, he hasn't seen them in 40 years, he just sits down to his dinner of a drumstick, a slice of toast, and mashed potatoes. Interesting plate choice. Now, I'm not sure what exactly happens here, but for some reason, Joshua acting normally makes his parents instantly turn into better parents. I'm sorry I yelled at you, honey. It's okay. I forgive you. Darling? Yes, dear? I'm sorry I yelled at you. I'll try to spend some more time with you. With both of you. <laughs> Just goes to show you what a little courage can do. With God's blessing, of course. He just sat down normally. Does he usually run away? I think the impact of this scene would have been more evident had we had some idea of what his personality was like beforehand. I mean, as far as I can tell, he hasn't changed at all. And then it's over. What did he learn? I mean, aside from how to kill people with a sword. Huh, my ten-year-old son is now suddenly acting like a grizzled war veteran desert survivalist. That's character! So that was Joshua and the Promised Land, a labor of love. And it was! Like I said, pretty much one guy made this thing, and to his credit, he managed to not only finish it, but get it on DVD. Perhaps it's better than to think of this as not a horribly animated, confusing spider nest of a kid's Bible study, and more an object lesson. That no matter how screwed up a video you work on might be, it could still get distribution. Well, that's all you need. Just make sure you don't let go of my hand.